Lord, let's, let's sing. So Pastor Brennan is our accompanist today, and you have to be the singers again. You have heard me say that several weeks in a row now as well. You have to sing with us the best you can. We're going to start off with two songs, Oh, Worship the King. We should know that one. And the other one is Jesus is the Song. Now, I want to talk about that one right now before we go to it. It's one of my favorite songs. We haven't done it in a long time, but I love the chorus to, these, to the words of Jesus is the Song. It says, Jesus is the Song of Life. And he is. Jesus is the song of joy, and he is. Jesus is the song of love, and he is. And finally, the one I really love the best, I guess since I've been a musician all my life, it says Jesus gives his song to you and me. So that's the words to our second song today. Let's sing, Oh, Worship the King.
Pastor Brennan. Well, good morning, and welcome to Sardis Baptist Church this morning. It is a delight to have you here. Again, you have just the awful privilege of listening to me play the guitar this morning, so bless your hearts. Um, If you are a guest with us today, we want to direct your attention to the bulletins here. We have a little tear-off thing. Uh, we, We ask that if you're a visitor, you would fill the information out on that card and drop it in the offering plate as, you pass, as it passes by you. We'd love to have a record of your visit so we can reach out to you, uh, get some information about you, and even learn how we can pray for you as a church. We have a couple of announcements that I want us to be mindful of uh, this morning. First, we, um, today following the worship, there will, there will be a called business meeting to approve the 2023 and 2024 nominating committee report. You should have had a little handout of the names and all the report that's there. In, that, uh, in the bulletin. So please uh, stay back for that if you're a member here. Uh, we want to remind everybody that our Wednesday nights have started back. So our Wednesday night youth and children has started back. It starts at 6.30. We have stuff from newborns to 12th grade for family ministries. But we also have a really exciting time in the life of our church as we're starting some small groups on Wednesdays for adults. So adults of all ages are welcome to these small groups. We right now have a men's Bible study that's meeting that's going through uh, Tony Evans's No More Excuses. We would love to have you here for that at 6.30 p.m. And there's also a ladies Bible study at, at, on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. All ladies are invited to attend that. Um, I think that's it. Well, one, one more announcement is that we have Grief Share will start back. This is a new 13-week session on Monday, August the 21st at 5.30 p.m. at the Sardis Family Life Center. Um, Grief share is a very, very important ministry, I think, in the life of our congregation, but also the life of many churches. Uh, if you're grieving through the loss of someone, through, through any, any sorts of griefs that you could imagine in life, th- this is a place for you to come and share those griefs with other people who are walking that same road. Uh, and, and, and it's a really, really healing time. I can speak from experience with my mother went, going through it. She, she really, really healed from it. Uh, so we, we would encourage you, if you need that sort of ministry, we have that for you. Okay. Well, without further ado, I want, to, um, I want to introduce our guest preacher this morning. He'll come up in just a little while after the next couple of songs. But Pastor Bowers was a missionary. He and his wife were missionaries to South America for 32 years, serving with the IMB in several countries. They're, I don't really need to introduce them to you guys. You know them well. They stayed here for, I think they said, a year in the missions house just a couple of years ago. So you know them well. We're excited to have him come and preach this morning from the book of uh, Luke, chapters 1, verses 5 to 25, and a couple others. Brother, whenever it's, t- it's your time, we welcome you up here and preach what the Lord would have you say to us this morning. Well, without further ado, let's pray and bless the service. O oh, great God of highest heaven, come and occupy our lowly hearts. conquer our rebel thoughts and our ways and reign supreme in our hearts. Jesus, make us more mindful of you today through the preaching of your word than we ever have been before. May we see, may we hear, may we know more of Jesus today. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Stand up again for offertory hymn this morning. And I know you know this one. Probably been a while since we've sang it as well. But it is called The Longer I Serve Him. Of course, the chorus says, The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Let's sing that together, please. Three, four.
the Lord been good to y'all this week? Yes, sir, he has. We woke up this morning to a beautiful Sunday morning. He has blessed us so much. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for what you have done for us. We thank you for these young men standing down here before us who are going to be our ushers this morning. May you bless each and every one of them and give them guidance and let them know the importance of serving you. As we go now into our service, we ask you your blessings on our service this morning. Uh, we ask you to guide and direct our speaker, give him words that he need to hear, and take those words that, that we hear out into the, into the world. And You don't have to witness to somebody to beat them over the head with the Bible. You can witness to them by simply smiling to them and thanking them, opening the door for them, showing them that you're a Christian. Bless each and every one of us today as we come to this time of giving. May we give with a cheerful heart just a small portion back to you that you have so greatly given to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. for a doxology. Before we do the doxology, we normally don't do this, but I think it's appropriate. Um, I would like to give Pastor Brennan a hand for um, helping us today. We do praise him for our blessings, including Pastor Brennan playing for us today, too. So let's sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Maybe say the pastor of Bowers. Good morning, neighbor. Good morning. It's always good to be back at Sardis. Uh, actually, we stayed here in 2014 for a whole year in the missionary house. In 2018, for six months, we did one Christmas here. We came home for Christmas. Uh, we spent one week in St. Simon's Island and two, I think, two weeks in Hartwell. And then we came back when we retired and spent a year in the house, and, and uh, we loved it so much. Uh, although we had never been to Hartwell, we, ne we now own a home in Hart County. So, excuse me, Hartwell, because I pay taxes in the city and the county. <laughs> um, a little update on our children, our sons. Corbin is 30 years old. He's married to Avery. They, 
He's a soccer coach now, not in Minnesota, but in, uh, in Oregon. And uh, Austin and Lindsay and our two grandchildren, Molly and Kanan, live in Malden, Georgia. He's all things coffee. He works for Methodical Coffee. He's not only a barista, but he's their new uh, green coffee buyer, trying to get into import and export business. Um, we're always thankful for the, the investment you put in our lives. We spent, I counted it one day, two and a half years in the missionary house. It's a holy place. Appreciate what's been done recently. Other people that have been involved in that. Um, it, it's a holy place and God ministered to us and spoke to us and, and we're extremely thankful for that. Um, one of the things I miss about South America especially is old people, or at least the respect, excuse me, for senior citizens, or we say in Spanish, la tercera edad, which means the, the third age or the graduating class. Um, I have fond memories of older people. I remember when I was 30 or 31 years old, and some of the first people that we baptized in our church in Cuenca, Ecuador, were Guillermina and Fidel, and they were in their 80s. They were in their 80s. I remember Agrippina, a lady in Loja province that always invited me into her house. Her son was a policeman, but he, she was in her 80s, and she would go out of her way to make me uh, hominy corn with a fried egg on top, and a strong, sweet cup of coffee. And I have fond memories. I have fond memories of, of old people. Therefore, the title of the sermon today, please do not be offended because I am not politically correct, Two Old People <laughs> and God's Loving Kindness. This is for Richard. Not two mean old people, Richard, or as he said, or two grumpy old people, but two old people and God's loving kindness. What I'd like for us to do is we're going to look at this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Almost called her Isabel. That's what we call her in, in, uh, in Spanish. We'll look at the characteristics of these two older people. Actually an older married couple that walked with God. Then I would like for us to look at how God manifest his loving kindness in these people. The third thing I'd like for us to do is to take away some salient points or some takeaways, and then uh, some takeaways from this passage. And then I'd like for us to think about how we might be able to, to pray for that. I'm going to encourage you during the, the invitation time if you're too old, if you think you're too old to come forward and kneel at the kneeling bench, fine, sit in the pew kneel in, in the pew and pray, and I'm going to encourage you to pray about some things that I'm going to propose. But before we do that, identify in your life, whether you're young or old, because the, most of us here are older, but some of you are younger. Whether you're young or old, identify an impossible situation in your life. All of us have impossible situations, things that are just impossibles in our life and before you know you know me I'm going to tell you that story of Zechariah and Elizabeth we're going to look at the text but first of all I'm going to tell it to you it'd be much easier if I could tell it to you in Spanish this morning I was working on it again in English I could do it in Spanish at the drop of a hat but I'm going to tell it to you in, the, in English because none of y'all would understand it in Spanish maybe one or two first of all I want us to look at the concept of hesed Hesed is the Hebrew word that's translated two or three hundred times or more for what the King James calls loving kindness. Therefore, two old people and God's Hesed. Two old people and God's loving kindness. That word is translated many, many different ways. For example, in Exodus 34, God talking about himself, 
The second time that Moses has the, the stone commandments, the, the Ten Commandments, remember the first, you remember what happened to the first uh, stone commandments? God refers to himself as compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abiding or abounding in love and faithfulness. In Psalm 136, 26 times that word hesed or loving kindness is translated. And it's translated mercy, graciousness, faithful love, steadfast love, loyal love, love that never quits, kindness. Or today we're just going to call it loving kindness. It's an attribute of God. It's not something that we can really say about ourselves as human beings. But it is something that we can say about God. Because God is loving. He's generous. He has enduring commitment. He's a promise keeper. And as one person said, Hesed is when the person from whom I have a right to not expect right to expect nothing gives me everything I don't have any God doesn't have to give me anything I'm not expecting anything but he gives me everything so let's start with the story three parts of the story the first story first part of the story I'm going to tell to you and then later on we're going to see we're going to read the second and third part Luke tells us, you can, this is Luke's first story, because in the first five verses, Luke dedicates his book to, to Theophilus. And the first story that Luke tells is this story. He says that there was a man, a priest, named Zechariah. And he was from the tribe of, or lineage of Abijah. And his wife's name was Elizabeth, and she was a descendant of Aaron. Listen to me as I, as I tell the story. Don't be di too distracted. He was a descendant, she was a descendant of Aaron. And it said that they were righteous, and they obeyed everything in God's law. But they did not have any children, because Elizabeth couldn't conceive. So one time when it was Zechariah's turn to work in the temple, he was a lay priest, he drew a lot, perhaps the third lot, and he went into the temple to burn the incense. And you can read about that during the week if you'd like. To burn the incense. And when he was burning the incense, the people were outside praying. And suddenly while he was burning the incense, an angel of the Lord appeared to him on the right side of of the altar and you can imagine that Zechariah was petrified he was afraid and the angel said to him Zechariah I have heard your prayer you and Elizabeth are going to have a son you're to name him John he is going to be a great man. He's going to be in the spirit and the boldness of the prophet Elijah. And he's going to do great things. People are going to repent because of him. People, fathers are going to turn back to their children because of him. And he is going to prepare the way of the Lord. That is, prepare the way for the Messiah. Well, you can imagine an old man saying, um, Lord, Zechariah said, I'm old. How's this going to happen? Elizabeth is advanced in age. That was this polite way of saying that she was old. <laughs> How are we going to have a child? And the angel of the Lord said, My name is Gabriel. I stand in the presence of of the Lord and because you did not believe and I and I'm bringing these good this good news 
from God himself. And because you did not believe me, you're going to be silent, deaf, or mute, and mute. And so, but this promise is going to be kept. God's going to keep his promise. So the people were wondering, where in the world is Zechariah? So he's taken forever. So finally he comes out. He goes back home. And sure enough, Elizabeth, almost said Isabel again, <laughs> became pregnant. And she stayed in seclusion for five months. And Elizabeth said to herself, God has shown his favor. He has shown his loving kindness on me. He has taken away my disgrace from not being able to have children. So the first thing we can say about this story is that Zechariah was a priest. Elizabeth was from a priestly family. They were both righteous in the sight of God. I don't know if you can fathom that. I've been thinking about that for weeks. Righteous in the sight of God. They had observed all of the Lord's commandments and decrees blamelessly. We would say in Spanish, um, intachable. That is, they had no marks against them. No marks against them. They walked extremely close to the Lord. They were not an ordinary couple. They were not just, as we would say in the Deep South, good people. <laughs> they were no ordinary couple. They were an extraordinary couple. But they had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive. And they were both what? Can you say it with me? Old. Can you say it? They were old. And, and they were disgraced culturally. To this day, not so much maybe in the States anymore, but to this day in most third world countries, it is a disgrace. It is thought, people are thought, not thought of so well when they can't, uh, can't have children. But let's see what God did through them through, them, through his hesed, or his loving kindness. So, so trek with me. If you want to follow uh, verses 5 through 25, I'll be taking some points through that. Zechariah had what? He had the spe God showed his loving kindness. Zechariah had the special privilege of being into the temple and burning the incense. That was not a, a privilege just for every average Hebrew Joe. It was a special privilege. Zechariah was chosen by Lot. We might say it was luck, but it was divine sovereignty. It was a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. Zacharias had an encounter with an angel. When's the last time you had an encounter with an angel? <laughs> and not just any angel. Who? Gabriel. The angel that stands in the presence of God. And it also says that God had what? Heard their prayers. What do you think their prayers were, even into old age? Their prayers were for a child, even into old age. And God showed his love and kindness by telling them that they were going to have what? A child. Not just any child, but a child that was what? Going to prepare the way for the Messiah. But in spite of Zechariah's doubt, God kept his promise. And who became pregnant? Elizabeth. We don't know how old they were. Just say it with me. They were old. <laughs> if that's 60 for you, fine. If that's 70 for you, fine. If that's 80, and I see one person that's at least 90 here, <laughs> um, it, old they were old and they were going to have a child okay and Elizabeth by God's loving kindness she realized what that it was God's hand 
and God took away her disgrace. She had been disgraced for 60, 70, 80 years culturally. She was disgraced. She didn't have, they didn't have a child, didn't have an heir. She was disgraced, but God took that disgrace away. Would you turn your Bibles to chap, the same chapter, verse 1, verses 39 through 45. Chapter 1 of Luke, verses 39 through, 30, through 45. This is the context. We don't have time to tell and uh, I know it's not Christmas yet. <laughs> we traditionally tell these stories at Christmas, but I'm not really, not really tied to that. These are stories of hope. Um, that same angel, Gabriel, has appeared to who? Mary. And, and that same angel, Gabriel, has told Mary that she's going to have a baby. That's going to be Jesus. That same angel, Gabriel, has told her that her relative, Elizabeth, who is old is going to have a baby. And this is what the word of the, God, the Lord says. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the kill, hill country of Judea, where she enter, entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When the Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of the greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. So in this encounter, Elizabeth was what? When Mary shows up to visit a relative, Elizabeth was what? Filled with the Spirit. And she was spiritually sensitive enough to know that she was talking to the mother of her Lord. She was spiritually sensitive, filled with the Spirit enough to know that she was talking to the mother of the future Messiah, the Messiah, the one they had been waiting on for a long time. And she also recognized once again what? God's loving kindness. God's hesed. And she was used by God to what? Reaffirm Mary's obedience. The Holy Spirit enabled Elizabeth to discern that the baby in Mary's womb was the Messiah, to know that Mary had believed Gabriel's message, and that the, that the mother that she, that she was speaking to was the mother of the Messiah. So you got the two two parts of the story. The story is not over with, right? First part of the story, Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to have a baby. Elizabeth is pregnant. She has a visit from Mary. She's filled with the Spirit. Okay? It's the, I now realize that's some, the first thing I've forgotten when I told you the story in Luke chapter, first part of the story. Um, the angel told Zechariah that this baby would be filled of the Holy Spirit before birth. And that's exactly what happened. So Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit. The baby was filled with the Spirit even before the baby. And who was that baby? John the Baptist, as we call, them, call him. Turn to chapters, chapter, chapter 1, same chapter, verses 57 through 62. Are you still with me? Okay. I see only one or two people sleeping, so. <laughs> I knew I should have brought my large print Bible because I, I just, I have a bilingual Bible and I was about ready to read the passage to you in Spanish. Once again, that would have not done you well. <laughs> When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up, his mother was Elizabeth, and said, No, he is to be called John. 
They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Nobody else, nobody else in the family has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet. So Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Can you see that? Okay. I should have taken more time to, to write that down, but I'm pretty sure that it, it probably would have been in Aramaic, not Greek. He would have written, his name is is John. Who just said that his name was John? His mother said his name is John. His name is John. They said to her, the, the, then they made the signs to the father and found out what he was, no, his name is John. Immediately, verse 64, immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe and through the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. The Lord's hand was with him. So here we have right here what? Elizabeth boldly saying, no, his name is John. Luke does not tell us how she knew that. There is no internal evidence to know that she knew that. Remember, Zechariah could not speak. And more than likely, he, was, he could not hear deaf and mute. There are all kinds of theories, but I'd just like to think that because she was filled with the Spirit and discerning, and maybe she had a conversation with Zachariah. Well, they didn't have a conversation. Maybe they had a, an iPad conversation. I don't know. <laughs> but we don't, we don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. But we, but we know that Elizabeth knew that her name was that his name was John and some of the neighbors had a the same neighbors interesting to me the same neighbors that had been a part of in family members okay we have we all have family members and and relatives and neighbors like this the same neighbors that had been a part of her disgrace the same neighbors who had if you will just sort of huh, that's that that's not Elizabeth. She couldn't have any children. <laughs> they were the same ones that were what? Ready to name the child. So I think you know a lot of people like that. <laughs> At least I do. The same neighbors that were a part of the shame were w more than willing to say, no, he should be called Zechariah. And she said, no, his name is John. And then Zechariah did the same thing. And so... I conclude with this part, in case you didn't know that. What in the world does the name John mean? It is a transliteration. So, probably, so Zechariah probably was writing in Greek. It is a transliteration from the Hebrew word to a Greek word. And that word, both in Hebrew and in Greek, the two principal languages of the Old and the New Testament, means Yahweh, Jehovah God. God is gracious. God is gracious. Do you see that? I know what my name means, Stephen, and I'm so glad that my mother, even though she's, she's been gone a few years, my mother, get, I know what my name means, but you can imagine that name means John, I mean, God is gracious. And then at the end, all of the neighbors and the relatives, what does it say? They were, say, they were, they were filled with wonder. I'm about ready to finish, so, so trek with me. I'm trying to make this generic, but one of the 
I think Barbara knows this because we see her sometimes there, but we like to go to Huddle House once or twice, well, once a week, I don't know. We haven't been recently, but, but uh, we go to Huddle House, and Huddle House had a server for a while that everything he said was awesome. So, what would you like, Mr. Steve? For I like an omelet. Awesome. What would you like, Mrs. Susan? Well, I'd like a Western omelet. Awesome. <laughs> uh, may I have the bill? Awesome. <laughs> uh, his whole vocabulary was awesome. And so, when Susan and I want to be sarcastic with one another, and, and we just, we've now been married 39 years, we just look at each other and say, awesome. <laughs> so, but, but really, the neighbors were in awe. They were overwhelmed at what had happened, and they said, what is this child going to be? What is this child going to be? So here's some salient points or some takeaways, if you will, from the, today's passage. I hope you're still with me. Number one, Luke does a masterful job of research. He researched the whole book of Luke, the whole book of Acts. He does a masterful job of research, and he does a wonderful job, if you know anything about Greek, of writing both of those books in this marvelous, eloquent Greek. He writes very well. He is a wonderful storyteller. But I want to remind you that although he is the storyteller, God is the author of the story. He's the storyteller. He did the research. He did the writing. But the author of the story or the stories is God. The author of your life is God. And someday somebody might write a story about you or tell some stories about you, both good and bad bad but God is the author of your story the second thing is that Zechariah and Elizabeth walked with God they were obedient to God I, I just had not been able to get away from that, that that various translations say that they were righteous and I, li I love to hear that because I'm so sick of what I've heard in North American Christianity since I've been back for the past two and a half years of like, well, he's just human. Well, she's just human. And that's the truth. We are just human. But what about trying to be like Zechariah and Elizabeth? Why not strive to be righteous? Why not strive to really put God's word into practice and we also see in this story that God is gracious and that he manifests his hesed or his loving kindness and we also see because this is another part of the story that you saw that we didn't read but you'll see if you read Luke 1 and 2 this this week nothing is impossible for God I love history I really love history I've loved history since I was a child. My mother, her name was Elizabeth, would sacrifice so that I could have history books at, at the particular level. I started in second or third grade, and I, lo I love history. Um, and oftentimes in our society, we hear this phrase, well, today history is being, make, being made. Or we hear the phrase, leave a legacy. I suppose there's nothing wrong with making history or leaving a legacy. But you know, the truth of the matter is, 
I don't know if you've recently walked, especially this section of the cemetery. Maybe not this section, because I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> but these people in this section of the cemetery are what? Long gone. And they are what? Forgotten. So one day, even if I try to make history, or even if I try to leave a legacy for my children or my grandchildren, um, people will forget who Stephen Wayne Bowers was. They'll forget my legacy. But I really want to be a part of God's story. They may forget about who I was, but they will, they'll know, yeah, Stephen and Susan were a part of that. They were a part of that movement. They were a part of that. And God will be glorified through that. So I would say one can never be too young nor too old to strive to be like Elizabeth. Live righteously. Be priest. We've forgotten that tenet among Southern Baptists, but we are a holy people. We have a strong strong belief do not lose it do not lose it to be a priesthood of the believers so we're all priests elizabeth and zachariah were priests we're all priests so we also have to learn to say no to our family and so typical to fashion, and you probably already know me, it's so hard for me to conclude with a sermon, conclude a sermon, but I'm, I'm not in the dark about what's happened to Sardis. I'm, I'm not living in the ignorance, I, nor do I have my nose in places that it shouldn't be, but, but I'm fully aware of, of of the pain and the struggle that's gone on, but I've come today to encourage you to realize that God is not done with Sardis. You may be a teenager. You may be in your 20s. I'm looking now. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. But God is not done with you. He's not done with you. He's really not done with you. Excuse me for being so crass. He's not done with you until you make a trip across the street. <laughs> so don't give up. And just remember that God can, 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 can use you whether you're young or you're old. And I'd like for you to Look at one more Bible verse, and we're going to conclude with this. Look in Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Verse 14. Psalm 90, verse 14. I really do want your hearts to be encouraged, because God is not done with you. Susan, I continue to pray for you. God's not done with you. God's not done, done with Sardis Baptist Church. And I want to encourage you to claim this same promise that's based on loving kindness. Because this, this same verse, it's translated different ways, talks about God's hesed or God's loving kindness. And I hope that this will be your prayer today, tomorrow, and the rest of, of your years. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. That is, satisfy us, O Lord, with your loving kindness so that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Let me see it right Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Whether it be in the pew, some churches, 
Even the church that we've attended recently have a custom of people still coming to the altar to pray. If you want to come into the altar to pray, that's fine. But let's be encouraged. God's not done with you. He still wants to show his loving kindness in you, whether you be young or old. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness. Thank you for the attentiveness and the great love of the people of Sardis. And I pray, the Lord, that you would bless them and keep them and may your face shine brightly upon them today and in the coming days. In the precious name of Jesus, the Messiah who did come to save us, I pray, amen. Him as the deer panteth for the water. You alone are my strength and shield. To you alone my spirit yield. Let's sing. As the deer panteth. As the deer panteth for the water so. service today. We thank you for the message that Pastor Bowers brought to us today. We thank you for your loving kindness, Lord, every day of our life, young or old. We pray as we go out these doors today that you go with us. We pray for those that are in need of your healing. We give you praise, Lord, for that healing. We give you praise for all the joys in our life. And Lord, we pray that uh, we also uh, are a blessing to others and that your light shines through us. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>